This series of interviews with Dan Burridge and friends forces the elected government to begin the long journey to actual disclosure that we are not alone in the universe. This is a serious attempt at objective corroboration by various credible witnesses as to their real personal experience with the presence of others on planet Earth. When the true history of alien disclosure is written, history will record that the 1980s were supposed to be the years of disclosure, beginning with Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater, both Republicans. The decision was made to tell the world that we are being visited. The following clips are examples of the emerging revelations by the powers that be, that they will now open the doors of the biggest secret in history. I can't back that up, but I think that uh, at Wright Patterson Field, if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government knows about UFOs. From his ham radio shack outside Phoenix, the senator disclaims direct knowledge of UFOs, but he does confirm a disturbing story about an exchange with General Curtis LeMay. Reportedly, a spaceship landed and it was all hushed up, quieted, and nobody ever, I've never heard about much of it. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, uh, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all this secret stuff. Can I go in there? I've never heard him get mad, but he got madder than hell at me, cussed me out, said, don't ever ask me that question again. President Ronald Reagan's speech to students at Falston High School soon changed all that. Suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries. Two years later, President Reagan made international headlines when he repeated the alien theme to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Edward Teller was selected by the secret government to choose two Area 51 scientists to begin the alien disclosure. First he chose Bob Lazar, who did his job very well from 1989 to 1991, as evidenced by this clip. Bob Lazar is a nuclear physicist specializing in advanced propulsion systems. In 1989, he was hired by the military to back-engineer the propulsion system of an extraterrestrial craft. Lazar worked at what is undoubtedly the most top-secret research facility in the world, S-4. There was no, absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S-4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. According to Lazar, the military had not been test flying alien crafts at Area 51. Rather, the disks many had videotaped and photographed were actually being flown out of S-4, just several miles away. The S-4 facility is an area just off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed, and it consists of nine hangars. The hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. At the time that I was working there at uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, there was a special projects EG&G building. When I was told to go to work, I drove there, parked my car there, got in a plane at the airport, flew to Groom Lake, where I deplaned and waited for a bus, and the bus drove me down to uh, S4. The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I, I think it was the third time I was up there. Upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced 
form of fighter that we've been working on for years, and you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And uh, it never even occurred to me, even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle, that you know, this wasn't man-made. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking, and I gave it the name the Sport Model. Um, there was one that looked like a jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Uh, there was a disc that was turned up on its side, and it had a large projectile hole with the metal bent outwards on it. Uh, I can only surmise they were testing it to see if uh, you know, a projectile could penetrate it. Next, Teller chose Dan Crane, a.k.a. Dan Burry's Ph.D., who began his series of disclosures while working at S4 in 1996 and continues until this day. The following interview with Will Uhouse took place on December 20th, 2005. And my mom and I both put him on the airplane to go there in Orlando. And he came back. When he came back, uh, we, we could see that he was visibly shaken all the time. He just was not himself. And we got him back to the house. And we were making dinner and stuff. And the guy just kind of, this is my father, he falls apart. You know, he just starts shaking. He says, I've got, I've got to say this. I've got to say this. And he says, they are real. I have now been invited to join the project. We have a disc, and it's not from this world. Captain Bill Uhouse served 10 years in the Marine Corps as a fighter pilot and four years with the Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as a civilian doing flight testing of exotic experimental aircraft. Later, for the next 30 years, he worked for the defense contractors at Area 51 as an engineer of anti-gravity propulsion systems on flight simulators for exotic aircraft and on actual flying discs. Will Uhouse hasn't seen his father in over five years. He is anxious to view this interview of his father that took place spring of 2000. I was at uh, Wright-Patterson, of course. I was approached by an individual that, and I, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, to determine if I wanted to work in a, a, an area and just new creative things, okay, and apparently that was a, a flying disc simulator. What they had done, they had selected uh, several of us and they uh, reassigned me to a Link Aviation, which was a simulator manufacturer. Uh, at that time they were building what they called the C-11B and F-102 simulator, B-47 simulator and so forth. And they wanted us to get the experience before we actually uh, uh, started work on the flying disc simulator, which uh, I spent 30-some years working on. So they had flying disc simulators. To your knowledge, when was the operation? I, I don't think any went in operation until the late uh, or early 60s, around 62 or 63. Uh, my, <clears throat> as I watch along, the reason why I'm saying this is because the simulator wasn't actually functional until around 1958, where uh, the simulator was actually operable. You know, for the simulator that they used, or the craft that they used to build, which is a 30 meter one, was the one that they crashed in uh, uh, Arizona, uh, uh, Kingman, Arizona, uh, back in 53 or 52. I think it was 53. That's the one they use. That's the first one that they took out to the test site. Not a controlled, 
you know, where they knocked it out of the sky or anything. It was a controlled craft, you know, that the aliens wanted to present to uh, our government or the USA. Uh, it landed about 15 miles from uh, which used to be an army air base, uh, which is now a defunct army base. I forget, the, I, rec I can't recall the name of it. <coughs> but that particular craft, there were some problems with number one, getting it on the flatbed to take it up to Area 51. They couldn't get it across uh, the dam because of the road. It had to be barged across the, you know, uh, the Colorado River at the time. And then taken up to uh, where people go now, up, uh, up 93, uh, out to Area 51, which was uh, uh, just being re really constructed at the time, and taken down those dirt roads and out, out to that particular area of the test site. Uh, there were four uh, aliens aboard that thing, and those aliens went to Los Alamos. Uh, four, basically, uh, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> it, it was a sort of a test thing. Uh, they set it. They set up the uh, Los Alamos with a particular area for those for those guys, and they put. Uh, Certain people into there, in there with them, uh, people that, uh, you know, were astrophysicists, you know, uh, uh, just general scientists, you know, uh, to ask them questions. Uh, the, funny, the way the story was told to me was, there was only one of them that would talk to any, to, to any of these scientists that they put in the lab with them. Only one of the aliens. The rest wouldn't talk to anybody, or you know, even have a conversation with them. Uh, you know, first they thought, you know, it was all, you know, ESP or, you know, what do I want to, what do I want to say? Uh, telepathy? Te yeah, mental telepathy. But, you know, most of that's, most of that is kind of a joke to me because they actually speak, uh, uh, maybe not like we do, but uh, they, they actually speak and can converse, you know. But there was only one. Uh, uh, let me say this. In the simulator, it was one one big thing different. The thing that, like Lazar calls the reactor. Okay, we didn't have a react. We had a we had a a space in a thing that looked like the reactor, but that wasn't the thing we operated the simulator with. Bob Lazar explains a gravity propulsion system that he worked on at S4. It probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole as what we were doing the fact that we weren't building this thing we were trying to find out how it was made we were back engineering it when I first got to look inside the craft the, the all I can say it's an ominous feeling you walk in there and uh, it's it feels as if you shouldn't be there. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's a real ominous feeling. It's not an exciting feeling. Uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions in your mind. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. The craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. This was quite quite a scientific feat to lift something completely silently under control and uh, you know perform a maneuver like that. I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower uh, the lower level essentially and there were three large gravity amplifiers these devices looked like about a two foot diameter four foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above and they can be independently positioned uh, and that's what what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft they'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground and as opposed to what we're used to for instance a plane once it's in the air we envision 
thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward, the crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity or two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill, and the craft rolls downhill for infinity. There's what they call Omicron configuration, where the craft is using one generator, uh, or delta configuration, where it's us utilizing all three. Delta configuration would be for space travel. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. It's always chasing a little distortion. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed. Gravity will vary somewhat, and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is, is kind of unstable for the most part. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. What you're dealing with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. Well, when you're on the outside, you know, you, you pretty much think, you know, how could they keep something like this secret? It's a crime against science, it's a crime against the people and, and all that, but you know, your feelings change once you're privy to the information. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. We operated with six uh, uh, large capacitors that were charged with uh, a million volts each, say there were six million volts in those capacitors, their largest capacitors ever built. Uh, these particular capacitors, they last for 30 minutes, so you could get in there and actually work the controls and do what you had to to uh, uh, get the aircraft or get the simulator, the, the disc to operate, okay? So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that simple because <clears throat> we only had 30 minutes, okay? And the reason why it was designed like that photo I showed you was actually when it, when it was operable, it would lift off the ball about <clears throat> a certain amount of, of, of uh, there was a, a dimension there that we had that it actually lifted up and it could actually turn, you know, a, a certain, certain amount of degrees left to right or whatever. But in a simulator now, uh, you'll notice that uh, there are no seat belts, right? Uh, and the same thing with the actual craft, no seat belts. You don't need seat belts. Because when you fly one of these things upside down, there's no upside down, like in a regular aircraft. You just don't feel it. And uh, it's a simple explanation for that, is the of those uh, discs. Uh, you have your own gravitational field right inside. So if you're flying upside down, to you, you're right side up. I mean, <clears throat> it's just really simple if people just look at it, just How no different they, than the planet. Inside the, did you ever get inside the actual craft? I was in there for a startup, sure. How do you, how do they image how do they? How do you look out the windows from one of these things with a? Actually, we didn't look out any windows. There weren't any windows. The only place we had any uh, visibility at all, and it was done with uh, <clears throat> with cameras or video type things at that time, was in the turret in the turret section. Okay, that's uh, uh, that has its own gravitational field. You would be sick or disoriented in about two minutes after getting in after it was cranked up. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes a lot of time because of the area and, and the smallness of it. Just to raise your hand, it becomes complicated. You have to be trained, 
train with your mind, you know, to, to accept what you're going to actually feel. And, and so there's and some experience. perceptual distortion. There's a lot of distortion. Yeah, yeah. Seeing, uh, just moving about, it's a, it's a, after a while, after you get used to it and all, and you, and you do it, it's, it's, it's simple. You just, you got to know where everything is, you know, and you got to understand what's going to happen to your body. It's no different than, you know, accepting the G-forces, you know, when you're flying a, a aircraft or coming out of a dive, you know, and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a whole new ball game. Each engineer that had anything to do with the design was part of the startup crew. Yeah. You know, verify all their stuff that they put in works like it's supposed to. Did our flight crews ever take one of these discs out into space? You know, I don't know that. I don't. I don't really know that. I, I just. I'm, I'm sure they have. Uh, I'm, I'm saying it probably took uh, took a while to train enough of the people or sufficient time. The whole big problem with this, with the disc is that it's so exacting in its design and so forth and it can't be used uh, say with uh, it can't be used as a uh, like we use aircraft today with uh, dropping bombs and and you know having machine guns you know and the wings and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a uh, the design is so exacting that you can't add anything. You can't. It's got to be. It's got to be just right. There's a there's a big problem in the. It's in the exactly design, what it is. Uh, of where things are put. Uh, say you know that where the center of the aircraft is and that type of thing. Even the fact that we raised it three feet so the taller guys could get in and stuff. The actual ship was extended uh, back to its original configuration, but actually raised of uh, meetings and stuff. And uh, we had a, a long period of introduction into meeting, you know, say uh, an EBE, an alien. And I, I called him J Rod. Of course, that's what they called him. But that wasn't his, you know. I don't know if that was his real name or not, but. That's the name that the the, the linguist gave him, you know. As a, as so he knew J. Rod, you know. And I I did draw a sketch of him when he was before I left of him in a meeting, but and I, I I I provided it to some people, but that was my my impression of what I saw. How much contact, individual contact, did you have with him? Oh, uh, he used to he used to come in with Teller. And some of the other guys occasionally on on questions that maybe we'd have, you know. But uh, you got to understand that everything was, you know, specific to the group. If it wasn't specific to the group, you couldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so need to know. Need to know. Yeah. And you know, speak. If and he'd talk, he would talk, but he'd sound just like if you spoke, he'd sound like you. You know, he. He's like one of the, you know, a parrot, you know, but, but he'd try and answer your question, you know. A lot of times he'd have a hard time understanding, you know, because it's, if you didn't put it on paper and, and explain yourself, half the time he couldn't give you a good, good, question, good answer. When you said there was a long build-up to actually meeting this person, what was the preparation like before you actually had a chance to have personal contact? Well, the preparation was, uh, you know, basically uh, going through, first of all, went to all of the different nationalities in the world, right? Just, you know, these, whatever, you know. Human nationalities. Yeah, human nationalities, you know. Then they got into going into uh, other forms of life, you know, even down to, uh, you know, animals and that type of thing. And the fact that, uh, you know, this, this, this J. Rod had his skin was pinkish, but a little bit rough, you know, and that kind of stuff. Not, you know, not horrible looking, you know. Or to me, he didn't look horrible looking. Some of the guys, you know, at, that was in the particular groups that I was in, they never even made it, you know. As far as I was concerned, you know, when they gave you the psychological question, you know, I just answered them the way I felt, and I had no problem, you know. And that's what they wanted to know. 
you know, if you'd become uh, like, you know, hey, here's an alien, he's, he's from here, and I don't know what, you know, one of those kind of things, you know. But it never bothered me, you know, it didn't, didn't, didn't amount to much. <laughs> so what kind, do you know what kind of scientific advice he would give the, the, the crew that was building or back engineering these? Basically, it was only engineering advice or science advice. You know, say for example, I performed the calculation, and there's a. I, I spoke of a, a book that. Uh, it's not a book. It's a big assembly of various different divisions of. Uh, Depict manuals. On gravitational technology. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the the key element in there. All the information wasn't there because even our guys, our people that were the top mathematicians and stuff, couldn't figure some of this stuff out. So we would take it and then, you know, we'd have to, with each design, you know, there's a requirement, requirement for calculations. And we'd have to prove by calculations, you know, that this thing's going to operate. No different than anything else we do. And sometimes you'd get into a spot where you try and try and try, and even if you use the formulas to come up with this thing that they'd provide you, it wouldn't work. And that's where he'd come in, you know, to tell him to look at this and see what we did wrong. 61, say, the last uh, 40 years or so, or 60 years, uh, maybe there's, uh, I'd say 40 years anyway, Man, not counting the simulators, I'm talking about actual craft. There's probably maybe two or three dozen various different sizes. That we've built or that we have? That, that are... we built. Okay. I don't know much about the ones that, you know, that they brought here. I know about that one out of Kingman, but that's about it. And uh, I know the company that hauled it out of there and who's out here now. <laughs> but, <laughs> you gentlemen earlier that 2003, most of this stuff will be out, out in everybody's plate to look at. Maybe not the way that everybody expects it, but in some manner they, they determine appropriate, you know, to show everybody, hey, look at what we got. So you, you know, think, big surprise. You think some this wisdom is the year 2000 that we're doing this interview, so you think within three years, that the public will be told. I said about. this years ago, 2003. And the reason why I said that, the document I signed ends in 2003. And you're not the only one that signed. And I'm not the only one. No. Rachel. 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 We were, um, she and I were allowed to uh, go out into the public for the first time, really, um, at Rachel, Nevada. I also noticed uh, he mentioned a couple of dates, 58 and 63 for the simulators. Right. 58 was a major treaty year, and 63 was the year that the Committee of the Majority actually took uh, precedence over MJ-12. And uh, those dates were right on the money. Have you met Dad? Uh, have I met him? No. Yeah, n not in person. Not as far as I'm right. aware, no. I don't, yeah. I don't remember him. I, um, the first I actually saw him was uh, when Ron showed me uh, uh, part of this video. Okay. And um, he may have been working in the, um, the uh, propulsion or down in 1B in Galileo 1B while I was there. I wouldn't know, though. <clears throat> I saw several people, whenever they would do, and, and, and it, he said startup, the startup protocols, uh, if they would start anything up inside of the bay, in the Galileo Bay, they would have the, uh, the doors to the windows shut. And um, um, I heard some some sounds coming out of there, but that was about it. Uh, but they actually had the door shut, so uh, um, if there was any temporal distortion or anything like that, um, I, I'm not sure what the doors were made of or whatever, but it would act as some sort of a shield, I guess, for the personnel coming would, in and out. You would hope so. <laughs> uh, right. Well, I never felt anything unusual uh, in there. I did down one floor, uh, one floor below in the looking glass facility when uh, I've had two chances to see that actually function, but 
uh, nothing up by the Galileo area. He could have been down in the in the simulator area when I walked past or was hobbling past barefoot one time to go get my booties. I wouldn't know. Yeah, dressed in those clean outfits, you probably wouldn't recognize hardly too many people anyways. No, yeah. no, uh, and the majority of people, any of them that you have face-to-face -face interaction with are those in your particular working group. And, you know, he was very correct about that. It's uh, whatever is just within your particular group. Yeah. Uh, everybody else is persona non grata. Um, would you mind recounting one more time about the flatbed? Oh, oh uh, this was in the mid-70s before I went to the police department. Dad and I both worked at the Nevada test site. Uh, under, he, was, he was under RICO when I was under uh, Holmes and Narver contract. Uh, it, and just because he was working for RICO doesn't mean that he wasn't pulled into these, these places over by Groom Lake and S4 all the time and, and my office was about 12 miles from the internal gate um, it's called the tweezer facility um, so he would uh, on the way from Mercury up making his way through the test he'd stop off at my office and say hello and howdy and chat with all the boys in there because he'd worked there you know for years before with a lot of the same guys that I worked with he said oh, I'm going off to the to the ranch now I'll see you guys on the way back and he, he would leave and come back. This happened numerous times. And this one particular time he stopped by, uh, he says, I'll probably need to ride back from the gate, and I'll give you a call when I, when I get there this time. I says, OK. And a few hours went by, and uh, got his phone call. And I j jumped in the truck there and went up and got, uh, got him at the gate. And hopped in, and I turned the truck around started to leave. And he punched me in the shoulder, and he says, well, well, look behind you real quick. I said, oh, okay. And I turned around and looked behind him. There's kind of a road that goes two different directions uh, in a Y shape like this, one towards Rachel, another towards another area. And there's a flatbed truck on it, large flatbed truck with a disc on the back that was covered up by tarps, uh, white tarps. And I'm saying... A disc, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, you know. Uh, okay, uh, Dad, what exactly is it? He says, oh, it's just a water tank lid. <laughs> <laughs> so. Here, right. Um, now it's, of course, he's almost like, feels like he, you know, doesn't have no hair. Yeah, no, that's true. And um, what did you see him doing? Did you see him in the residential units or in the lab I, or both? Uh, I actually saw him in... The residential units a few times, and of course in the labs too. Oh, he was out at the ranch. So you the the, the 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 real ranch. I mean, yeah. I mean, where, where they have the biological uh, so samples of the. Things are let loose. And uh, well, well, actually, they inhabit the entire test site just about. I I, I had a pet my tarantula. Cat, my cat is from there. I've got uh, uh, cheesy. She's out <laughs> in the laboratory. From uh, there. She's a transfection uh, animal. I, I had a pet desert tarantula. It was about this big, and and it would go, it, it would actually habitat my desk drawer, and it would eat lunch with me, you know, and come out and grab a piece of bread or something, and or a piece of meat off my sandwich. And, Did it salute or anything? Uh, no, I wouldn't salute it, but I ended up taking it home with me, and it was it was not the hit that I thought it was going to be <laughs> when I got it home. <laughs> In fact, I got. I got in trouble for taking that thing home. I could have got 20 years or 25 years for it, but even just bringing this little pet home with me when I left the site. But uh, it, it, there was another pet that one of the guy, other guys had there. It was a raven. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure the fellow wouldn't mind me. This is, he has nothing to do with this this kind of stuff. But, uh, his last name was Stacy. His first name was Jim, Jim Stacy. He had the desk closest to the back door when we all ate lunch. And there was this huge raven that would come there and eat lunch with us as well. And probably waist high to you, Ron. And you know, that's a big bird. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's a big bird. And, and, and they're very lingual, as you know, and everything. Do you think No, no, I, I, forgot, I, I forgot what we called him, but... Uh, as we'd be sitting there eating Just lunch, this bird had higher IQ than Condor. As, as we'd be sitting there eating lunch at the tweezer facility, uh, uh, the phone would be ringing constantly because everybody wanted us. 
And the telephone rang, and Stacy picked it up. I was like, Tweezer facility, Stacy here. And I, mm -hmm. I had, of course, to go there on a weekend when Jim wasn't there. And, of course, Bird comes and visits, and I toss him some bread out the window, the door. And uh, the, the phone rings, and I just says, oh, I'm not going to bother with that phone today. It's supposed to be my day off for crying out loud. <clears throat> and the phone quit quit ringing after about 10 rings, and all of a sudden, the raven goes, Tweezer for Stacy Stacy here. <laughs> <laughs> the name, the name he's using, the name he's using, Tweezer. By the way, uh, that name is fairly well known to the point where I have a running joke with uh, Victoria Nicole. Uh, on on uh, uh, any given week, her mathematics teacher will uh, give a brain teaser, and they are nicknamed brain tweezers between. She and I. <laughs> Brain tweezer. <laughs> yeah, they're called tweezers. Well, mm -hmm. this one actually got its name because uh, we had occasion to, to uh, uh, devices as they're called, sometimes don't go off. Mm -hmm. So they have to be taken apart. And in the tweezer facility, mm -hmm. we had the facilities there to take one apart, actually. Right. Quite a feeling when you're sitting on top of one of those babies. Mm -hmm. Why is it there? Because it didn't go off. And why are you doing this? Because you're crazy. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely nuts. Sitting on top of a nuclear device. We didn't call them bombs. They weren't bombs. They were devices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's why that facility got. Started. I'm trying to remember the name out of uh, Strange Love, the guy that rode the bomb down. Oh, that was a good movie. Huh? Slim Pickens. Slim Pickens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yep. Well, we'll pass along to your father, if you please. I best certainly will, man. Wishes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. I remember one report where an object got in behind the trailing edge of the large wing and ahead of the smaller wing in the position, open position there, and remained for two or three minutes, and they got pictures with all of the movie cameras and the handheld cameras, including the 8x10 Fairchild camera. All of the data that was recorded by this special equipment, the cartridges, cassettes, rolls of film, and everything, after a mission with an encounter was removed from the canisters and the equipment items and packed in a metal box and chained to an officer's wrist and flown to Washington that night. And this happened on a frequency of about three or four times a month for the whole year and a half that I was doing this in Alaska. Sidebar corroboration, Wendell Stevens discussing his interview with Bill Uhouse in 1994. Wendell, if you could tell us what you know about uh, Bill Uhouse and how uh, he was reacting with the aliens and, and uh, the Kingman crash and so forth. So take it away, Wendell. Well, <clears throat> Bill Uhouse came to uh, our International UFO Congress in uh, Las Vegas at the time. Now it's at Laughlin. In about 19... 93, I think, or 94, and he came up to me there during a break, and he said, uh, he said, I uh, know something about these things. He said, I worked on them. And I said, oh, man, we got to talk. And so uh, we went down to the restaurant to get away from the crowd there, and he told me that uh, he was a simulator specialist, in Area 51 that he began there a long time ago when he was, I believe he said he was working at Dayton and he was reassigned out to, uh, they sent to him to a link school. At that time, Sperry was making the link trainers and he went to a school at Sperry first and then he went out to Area 51. And he said that he was working on simulators to teach pilots to fly new airplanes that had never been flown before. Later he told me that they were training pilots to fly discs that we were manufacturing too. That was, came much later. He said that uh, what I found interesting at the time, he said that he was working with an alien extraterrestrial, a living one, at Area 51, which was a little hard for me to believe at that time. 
he said that, uh, and, and because I was, was not acting too convinced, I guess, he offered the information that he, being an engineer and being in the Link Trainer project, he was drawn into the group of engineers to prepare the habitat for some alien extraterrestrials that were going to come here and, and remain, to come here and work with us. And the alien extraterrestrials gave them the specifications for the habitat. They wanted a, a living facility that included, among other things, in the sanitary facilities. The, the bathroom was a little different from ours. It didn't have a urinal, didn't have a, a, a commode, a, a, a toilet. It uh, had a shower and a wash basin. The shower had two nozzles in it, and one nozzle was designed to dispense a, an enzyme, a, a thick enzyme, and the other one was a water nozzle, and the, the understanding was that the aliens would lay themselves with the enzyme, rub it all over their bodies, and wait a time, and then rinse it off, and it would de be collected in the bottom of the shower, filtered out, those enzymes would be filtered out, put back in the enzyme tank, and the water would be flushed away, which I, I thought was very interesting, because my information at that time was that uh, the extraterrestrials, reticulans that I was working with Bill Herman on over in Charleston, South Carolina, did not have a gastrointestinal system. They didn't have an anus. They didn't have a belly button. <clears throat> they didn't have an esoph esophagus. They didn't have, uh, uh, they took their alimentation in their mouths. The mouth, the cavity was filled with folds of tissue that absorbed the nutrient and they simply spit out what was left over. Uh, at the time, I was thinking, what a marvelously efficient system. Why do we have 32 feet of gut in us to uh, absorb uh, the nutrient when there's a simpler way to do it? Anyway, uh, he said that that, they, that, that was the, the conditions for the, the laboratory. Then we had to manufacture, he said, uh, food supplies, foodstuffs for the aliens that were coming here and they brought cultures from their home planet that we had to prepare the culture for them and, and prepare their food for them in the facility out there at Area 51. And he said that the cultures, he understood the cultures were uh, materials that were low in the food chain, uh, scums, chlorophyll, bacteria, things like that that are very low in the food chain, didn't require a lot of energy to digest. And we had to, pr to culture these these foodstuffs and prepare them for the alien extraterrestrials were going to come here to live, which we did. Very and, interesting. And so uh, it, it, this seemed like a very involved process. And uh, and he told me in another meeting, we talked a little bit longer on that, he told me about after they arrived, he actually w began working with one of the visitors. He said that two came at that time. And he said he began working with one <coughs> that uh, when they were under a console working on something where the conditions were, light conditions were less than ambient relative darkness, he could see through that black eye and he could see a pupil and an iris or an iris and a pupil behind this uh, what looked like black onyx oval eyes, the big eyes. So he was pretty sure that, they, that, that that was a lens of some kind or a protective covering that they were wearing over their eye because they didn't have any other way to wear it. They had no nose to support spectacles, you had no ears. The nose was uh, just two slit nares uh, with no, not much of a protuberance. The ears were just uh, fleshy pits with a membrane over them. And uh, I found that interesting because I was convinced that the Santelli film was real having investigated the crash site. And now on the Santelli film we removed a a lens that was flex flexible and they removed it from under the eyelid and then we could see the eye on the sand telephone which confirmed what Bill had told me years before. And another case I was investigating in Switzerland when uh, a discussion of the reticulans came up he said that the, the, the Pleiadians knew about the reticulans and that uh, uh, they had some kind of interaction with them but they weren't controlling them. And uh, he he offered the comment that those big black eyes were lenses at the time, and I laughed inside myself because I thought, gee, he doesn't know nothing about them. I'm investigating his case. There's no indication that they're lenses. 
And later we find out that Bailey was right. But uh, yeah, Colonel Corso told me the same thing that you know, my, when I interviewed him in '97 in Roswell. Interview with Colonel Philip Corso, U.S. Army retired, author of The Day After Roswell, in Roswell, New Mexico, July 1997. And that thing on the movie, people asked me, I thought, well, there was some truth to that, because they pulled out an eyelid, and no one knew about that eyelid. That eyelid was a light gather so they could see in the dark. They had a third eyelid. You mean the, uh, the autopsy film? Yeah. You're referring to? No, the autopsy that I had said about the third eyelid, mm -hmm. and this autopsy was on TV. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you see, but they reached over and pulled an eyelid out. Mm -hmm. Now, no one knew about that. Mm -hmm. And people have asked me, what did you think of it? I told them, well, I have to give it some credibility because I saw three things on there which people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Now, only I know about them because of the autopsy and I'd seen the creature. That they, they saw that and he thought that he thought the Santelli film was true because no one knew about that that extra lens that had a gathering light. Yeah. And that's how night vision goggles took place. He we, took that to Fort Belvoir. Those lenses, and that's how he developed night vision goggles. Well, night viewing device. Yes. Well, we called actually they're called image intensifiers. The simplest word is night viewing devices. Uh, that mostly they came from. We used two sources. One was the German infrared, which was pretty good, and the other was the eyelid of the extraterrestrial. These extraterrestrials can see in the dark. Actually, the eyelid was a light collector, and behind it was we made an item that collected rays and reinforced them, and that was the beginning of the night viewing device, or integrated imaging devices we call them. Well, that's fantastic. And he said that. Uh he went there and he had a check, a white budget for $60 million. And he told the people at Fort Belvoir that uh, <clears throat> it was good news and bad news. The good news, they would get the $60 million. Bad news, they had to do it in 12 months because we needed it in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And we had night vision goggles, but they were big as a truck or a tank or something. Mm -hmm. So they, they achieved their goal and, and so our soldiers had night vision goggles because of what we back engineered from the alien. Oh, that's interesting. I never heard that before. <clears throat> so anyway, Bill went on to, uh, uh, this, he said that they were summoned to a conference in Los Alamos in 1968, a progress review conference, which was several years after we had, after the aliens had come here. And this was a conference to find out what progress we had made in working with them in, in back engineering technology. And uh, he said that there, Edward Teller was at the head of a big table with about 18 scientists sitting around the table, and that he and his extraterrestrial friend were called into the same conference, and he said they put the alien in a white shirt and slacks like ours to sit around the table to make him look less alien, but he still was pretty alien. He sketched a picture of what he gave me. Uh, you know, all engineers are pretty good. Yeah. yeah, all engineers are pretty good sketch artists. And he sat right across from the alien. And the alien knew all the conversation was going on, but I don't know how he participated because the alien didn't talk our language the way we do. He he, he didn't articulate the words like we do. So there was, a, but Bill had learned to communicate with him, and Bill knew from what he understood from the alien that we probably are never going to bridge the gap between the two technologies because that alien technology required a certain mental input and we never learned to input the mental requirement for such uh, science. So we st apparently still haven't succeeded. Then uh, he told me also that there was a, a strange thing that he remembered from uh, other engineers working in Area 51, he said there was a, a crash up north of Kingman that was recovered intact. The vehicle was relatively undamaged. He said that, that the engineers that were trying to load it to haul it back said that they couldn't tilt it. When they picked it up, it came up flat. They were trying to tilt it so they could mount it on a tank hauler flatbed at an angle because it was about 30 feet in diameter. 
and they couldn't mount it that way. It, it, it wanted to stay flat. So they had to take it roundabout ways using cross-country uh, roads that were prepared ahead of them and then closed behind them and, and taking down telephone lines and power lines to go through and they couldn't go over the dam so they had to barge the object across the, the water there, the reservoir. And he said that a peculiar thing about that particular recovery, it was making a noise when they brought it to Area 51 and the engineers tried everything they could think of to turn off the noise and couldn't do it and they were getting more and more perplexed by the inability to do so and some, then somebody suggested why don't we bring the occupants back and ask them to turn it off. Sure, why not? So after some discussion they did send back to Los Alamos for the occupants to come turn it off and they brought them over in a carryall, a van. Uh, they indicated with gestures and signals what they wanted them to do and the aliens indicated they would have to go inside. They decided to let them go inside. They'd send somebody with them to be sure they didn't take it off again. And the aliens were inside about three or four minutes. The ones outside were getting concerned about what they might be doing in there when the sound turned off. And they came back to the door and, and uh, waited to be put back in the van and taken back to Los Alamos. What about the guard that was there? The guard went in the door with him, but he came right back out vomiting and retching and refused to go back in. And I don't know what would cause that, but he didn't know either, but they thought that was peculiar. That, 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 and they asked a pilot standing by if he would go in. He said, no, no, not me. Send somebody else. Anyway, they, that was a peculiar thing because that one kept making a noise until uh, the, the aliens were brought over to Flip the right switch or flip the right over. switches. Yeah, he believed. He said the engineers believed because of the time that the aliens were in there that they must have activated the systems and contacted their their fellows somehow before they came back to the door to to leave. So ET was calling home while they. <laughs> that appears to be what that was the speculation anyway over the time that it took them to turn to turn the noise off inside. But just the concept that we have alien engineers talking to our engineers. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty exotic, yeah. And I've talked to Bill Uhouse's son, Will, and mm -hmm. showed you the tape of... Yeah, uh, that's interesting. And how he <clears throat> confirmed what his dad said. That was very similar to what happened in Roswell. When the, the debris was brought there, the family saw it. Mm -hmm. But Will Uhouse was uh, born in 1953 with the crash, so I mean literally his whole life started with the crash in 53 and his father coming home and telling him little bits and pieces of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's corroboration for me. Yeah. Part of the proceeds from this series of interviews will be dedicated to creating a memorial to all of the UFO researchers, scientists, military and civilians who have been threatened, persecuted because of their involvement in this subject for the last 60 years. Dan Burrish, patriot scientist, who is being documented in this series of videos, has had an extremely difficult life in the employ of the secret government. He does not lament his fate, but rather sees his work for the government in a positive light and tries to perform his scientific duties in a major effort to benefit humanity. The key is disclosure, as he states in another interview. As the cover-up begins to unravel here in 2006, it is time to honor those who have fallen and been victimized by the secret government. These sentiments are best summed up by the former Secretary of Defense of Canada, Paul T. Hellyer. The whole cover-up, because mm -hmm. I'm convinced that there has been a systematic, uh, thorough, and very successful cover-up mm -hmm. for half a century uh, or more. The, the whole cover-up really led, lends credence to uh, Latham Lapham's theory of the two governments. Mm -hmm. 
and I suspect you're you're familiar with that. But the shadow government and the real government. But he calls the the real and the provisional, okay. or the permanent and the provisional. Right. And he uh, he says that the United States government, the the permanent government, is the Fortune 500 list, mm -hmm. okay. and the uh, the top uh, uh, legal firms in Washington that do their legal mm -hmm. work, and the top PR companies that do their public relations or propaganda, if you want to uh, be a little more vulgar about it, <clears throat> and uh, the top uh, civil servants, both military and civil. And they run the United States. And every few years, and here I paraphrase a little bit with the license that I have as a former politician, uh, they have a charade called an election. And the permanent government picks the actors to go on stage and read the uh, scripts written by the permanent government. And they try to uh, to pick actors that won't improvise too much, and uh, who will do as they're told, in effect. And then they give them the money to get elected, and nobody else need apply. Well, I believe in seeking the truth, and uh, <clears throat> in the good book it says if you seek the truth, it'll make you free. And I don't think there's any other approach. I don't think you can live a lie. <clears throat> I'm a, a religious person. I'm not the least bit concerned about uh, disclosure I, <clears throat> and I'm absolutely determined that we find out what the truth is and uh, and I think that I think it's just natural and inevitable that there are other species uh, elsewhere in the uh, galaxy or galaxies that uh, are more advanced technologically than we are and probably morally and spiritually as well and that we should cooperate with them and learn from them and work together to, uh, to <laughs> You know, I'm used to saying make a better world. Well, we'll start with trying to make our world better, but maybe we can cooperate uh, in making a better galaxy or galaxies. And uh, that this, these are the kinds of, of uh, projects uh, and policies that we should be adopting. Colonel Philip Corso speaking at the 50th anniversary of the crash at Roswell, New Mexico, 1997. I fought the greatest armies the world has ever seen and defeated them and destroyed them. Those boys didn't panic. And the young people today are not going to panic. Let's tell them the truth. They want to hear it. They keep asking me, tell us the truth. Dan Burry's interview at a secret location, June 7th, 2003. Um, I would be very happy, very happy and very relieved to feel as though I was responding to the elected government of the United States of America with what talents God's given me. I'm responsible to the people of the United States of America. The nature of the information to which I'm privy is sensitive enough that the full disclosure of that information would have to be done in an appropriate location and under appropriate circumstances. Certain military application information would have to be done um, in a closed session milieu for the national security. The Congress knows it's not in control. They know that this is a train a wild train out of control. And they want that control back. They're not stupid. They know that there are things that are going on down the hall from them that they can't fathom. They deserve to have that back in their hands because that's what they were elected to do. And if we care at all about what's left of our Constitution, they deserve to have that in their hands. Uh, aren't we the masters of our destiny in our country? Aren't we supposed to be? Yes, sir. Supposed to be. All presenters in this video have military backgrounds and are dedicated to disclose the truth about the UFO reality.